Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Business Brew. I'm your host, Bill Brewster. This episode is brought to you by Quafin. Quafin displays financial information simply and elegantly. Quafin is one of the fastest growing platforms for financial data and analytics to research stocks and understand market trends. I discovered them thanks to their very passionate users, many of which are my friends. Imagine a Bloomberg light with tons of high quality fundamental data, a powerful graph engine that can show it all clearly, and a user interface that doesn't look like it was built in the 1990s. If you're an individual investor, research analyst, portfolio manager, or financial advisor, do yourself a favor and check them out. You won't regret it. Sign up for free at koifin.com. That's K-O-Y-F-I-N.com. This episode, uh, this Monday episode of The Business Brew is exciting for me. It's a different tact from what we're normally doing. I'm going to drop some of these occasionally. You heard one with Seth Porges. This is Kyla Scanlon. She is a Finfluencer, for lack of a better term. She may not like it, but I'm going to call her that. And the reason that I wanted to do this episode is I really like how Kyla does her content. I think that Kyla is somebody that is thoughtful. She is quick-witted. She gets her content out quickly. So she's on top of current events. And I think that she is somebody that is attempting to do the influencer economy around finance in the right way. And I am interested in how younger people are going to get introduced to finance. I think we've all seen some of the TikTok investors. We've all seen some of the trading mentality that's permeating culture. My perception of Kyla is she's someone that's doing it the right way. She's interested in big topics. She's not pumping ideas. She's just out there trying to learn in public. And I wanted to have a discussion with her because I think she brings a unique perspective that frankly, you know, uh, the typical listener base may not understand or be privy to. So I hope that this episode gives some sort of insight into what's going on in a part of the financial community. And I hope you all enjoy. And uh, with that, let's get to the episode. Tyler, how are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you? <laughs> I'm good. I'm excited <laughs> to talk to you. Yeah. I, um, I've been internet stalking you a little bit lately, but not in a weird way. <laughs> as long as it's not in a weird way. <laughs> No, it's not. Um, so, uh, you know, for people that don't know who you are and sort of what you do, uh, do you mind giving a little bit of a background on what you, th like you're a content creator that comments on the market. Uh, I don't, but I, I don't want to pigeonhole you as that because you got a lot, a lot of stuff going on. Um, so just kind of how would you frame, frame what you do? Yeah, no, it's a good question. And it's something I've been thinking about a lot lately. So I think financial content creator is probably the best umbrella. So I make TikToks, I make YouTube videos, I write a newsletter. Um, I have my Twitter, which I just like post random ideas on. Uh, yeah, and then I work full time right now in tech and previously worked in asset management. But I would say like financial content creator probably encompasses most of what I want to do. An educator, I think I'm like tr sort of leaning towards that title too. Like that's what I want people to sort of think of my content as is like a different form of education. So that's also something yeah. I've been leaning into. Yeah. So when you say that you work full time in tech, what does that mean? Like, because to me, what you, the amount of content that you put out is a full time job. It, well, it is. Yeah. So <laughs> um, I do have uh, two full time jobs right now, um, <laughs> or it feels that way sometimes. So yes, I, I tend to work a lot, but I really enjoy the content. It's so fun and it's so rewarding too and so fulfilling. So it's, it doesn't really feel like work. Yeah. So it's like a hobby. It's like a very intensive hobby. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, I can tell, I can tell how much you love it because you, um, I, I, how much work goes into a TikTok video? Because, you know, somebody consuming it can look at something that you mm -hmm. do and it's like, oh, this is just 90 seconds. How long could that possibly take? Uh, yeah. you seem to have a lot of work that goes into each 90, 
second snippet. Yeah. I mean, so uh, Hank Green, who's like one of my favorite creators, he had this video talking about how like you want to make the videos look like they're not a lot of work. I'm still like learning how to edit and still learning how to do all that. But I would say probably three hours of work, three to four hours max, most like minimum, minimum goes into some of the videos yeah. between scripting and editing and I do different costumes. Um, <laughs> so yeah, it, it can definitely be a little bit of a lift for some of them. Yeah. I like, uh, I was checking out your YouTube channel and I like how your background was a bunch of stars in the one that I was watching and you were like fielding. It was almost like an ask me oh. anything on YouTube. Oh yeah, that was, that was like way early. So that was back in March or April. So I was still like trying to find my footing as a content creator. So like was really like, oh my gosh, who are these people watching me? Uh, so I did an, like an AMA on my TikTok live and I just had my audience come on and just ask me a bunch of different questions. I remember being so nervous too, because like at first there was like one guy in the room and I was like, oh my God, it's just going to be me and this guy. <laughs> it's just going to be me and this creep. <laughs> And his name was like Dr. Stonks. And I was like, hey, Dr. Stonks. <laughs> and then more people yeah. started to come in. But yeah, that was like, that's such a vivid memory for me because it was the first time that I'd ever gone live. Like the first time that I'd ever really like felt like a content creator, I guess. So yeah, yeah. Wait, so when did you get the idea that you were going to be whatever the heck you and I kind of do? Right. Um, so actually, I, th I think you're yeah. much more visual. You're you're way more talented. I'm just some guy on a radio, basically. Yeah. No, no. I mean, everything everything is art. I think that yeah, a lot of people are like, oh, I can't do this. I'm not talented. I don't have an artistic bone in my body. And I'm like, oh my gosh, yes, you can. Like, just put your pen to paper. Or, like, just start talking, and you'll get used to it. So, um, yeah, I, I've been doing this since I was 18. So I started a blog uh, about options trading. Um, because I was in Kentucky and I was like, I don't know who else knows about this. So I might as well go online and write about it and like bring other people through the process as I learn about it. So I started writing um, and then all throughout college would write like equity research papers, tried to do like a YouTube back then, but didn't really have like the capacity to. And then started working in asset management at Capital Group and had to put a pause on all that. Um, and then just recently in December 2020 ish, started doing the TikToks and it wasn't until like April-ish where I was like, oh, like this is actually something that, like when Bloomberg started reaching out to me, I was like, oh, okay, uh, all right, this is probably something more than, than maybe I thought it was, um, which is like awesome, right? So it, it's so great to be able to do this, you know? Yeah, no, it's amazing. I, how do you um, think, think about like the responsibility that comes with this? Mm -hmm. I mean, you said that you want to identify as a, as an educator also, mm -hmm. right? And I was reading in the Wall Street Journal this weekend. There was, uh, that paper. you know, like this Finfluencer. I saw that I, there's so many hucksters in the game, you know? Like, how do you think mm -hmm. through that? Yeah, I saw that article. Um, a lot of people sent me that article. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, so it's really unfortunate because there's a lot of people on TikTok that are like shilling out different crypto coins, um, different stocks and like pump and dumps. There's a ton, a ton, a ton of that on TikTok and Twitter and just basically across the board. And for me, um, like I'm trying to be the opposite of that. Like I'm trying to be a place where people can go to actually get information. So I'm very clear with my audience on TikTok. I'm not going to tell you what stocks to buy. Like that's literally, we're going to talk about monetary policy and why it affects you and other things like that. Like I'm not going to be like, you should buy this stock because it's going to go up 4,000% because that's so irresponsible and it's so unfair to like the, honestly, the industry and the people who are trying to get into the industry. Like there's already enough like gatekeeping and enough barriers and these people who are shilling stuff make it even harder and even less accessible. And it's just, yeah, it's, it's super frustrating. But for me, I try to really work against that and really be a place where people can come for like hopefully quality content about a, a, a lot of different things. Yeah. So like I, I, um, I mean, I view the, the podcast as similar, right? Like mm -hmm. I, I didn't like traditional financial entertainment and sort of education or there were certain things about it that sort of bothered me and I was mm -hmm. like well could I do you know a podcast that is um is sort of fulfill fills a niche right that I want to hear mm -hmm. but uh the bigger the reach for me the scarier it is because I'm like oh my gosh you know people actually think that I'm an authority all of a sudden and mm. uh that doesn't I, I don't know it's a responsibility that's been interesting to wrestle with yeah. I mean, it's same with me. Like I've been tagged as like a 
knowledge leader, which I'm like, oh my God, in a couple of different things. Uh, I'm like, I don't want that title. Um, so it is something it's, it's, that's a little tough because like a lot of people end up either like absorbing your opinion and, and like turning it into their own, which can be all, like hard. So you have to be like really conscientious and like neutral about how you say things. And that's what I try to do in my TikToks. Like I don't like I'm not going to be like Bitcoin's the best ever. Like that's not something I'm ever going to do. It's more so like this is what Bitcoin does and this is how you can think about it and incorporate it into your framework versus um, this is how you should think about everything all the time. And I try to, and I am very clear in like the YouTube videos too, like this is just my opinion. Um, I think differently than you and that's okay. So yeah, there's room for, there's like gray space there, you know? Yeah, for sure. Um, I think one of the things that's tough, I was listening to you and Caitlin Cook on uh, the podcast that y'all did. And I think one of the things that's also tough is, uh, you know, by definition, we're we're, we're sort of in an attention business. So there's like this inherent tension between wanting to do the right thing, but also wanting to have people pay attention to what you're saying. And, um, yeah. I don't know. It, it creates a lot of, um, potential for people to exploit. Right. But I don't know how different something that I've been thinking a lot about lately is like, how different is this than what sort of financial advice has always been? Um, I'm certain that the internet creates like a level of scale and a dynamic to it that's way different, but I'm not certain that the outcomes are any worse. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if that makes sense. No, it does. It, that's like kind of my beef with the, everything too. I'm just like, okay, so and especially like with the Finfluencer Wall Street Journal article, like a lot of people are like, oh my god, it's so irresponsible, and like some of these people, yes, they are irresponsible. I know that for a fact. But across the board, like it's not bad for people to learn from social media as long as they're incorporating the right like framework and saying like, okay, these people like you shouldn't listen fully to like what anybody says unless they're maybe like a scientist. Um, yeah. Where it's like where it's like yeah. quantitative and you can prove it. Like you can't prove anything really in finance except for like previous returns. Um, so I think like everything is speculation and we tend to have a lot of guardrails as you know around who can speculate versus who can't so i think it's just shifting into a more decentralized speculation space and people seem to have like a lot of uh, issues with that because it's a little bit wild right now every the market's like hasn't calibrated to this newness yeah yeah the uh the thing that i i also kind of wonder is with the like talking about the market calibrating to the newness, Mm -hmm. the meme stocks and like the, the, the speed at which information can get diffused and like how quickly, you know, something like, um, I mean, I, I hate to use the GameStop, uh, example because I'm not really sure what actually happened there. (laughs) Like I know the institutions were really involved in that. Um, but it is amazing how fast, it seems as though these things can happen. Mm -hmm. Uh, Whether or not my perception's true is sort of something that I'm uncertain on, if that makes any sense. Yeah, no, I I feel the same. And I I thought a lot about GameStop when it was happening because I was still at my old job in asset management. And it just felt like this was like not supposed to happen, but, and it was also impossible to happen at the scale that it did happen with retail investors. And now you have you just have and, and people are still like hanging on to that idea of like oh GameStop is like in this dark pool and like oh everything is like it's a big conspiracy and the hedge funds are trying to squeeze us and there's like such a disconnect between <coughs> like what what these people are thinking and I think like what's actually happening and it's just really like Wall Street bets has turned into this big conspiracy theory um, essentially where people are talking about GME AMC and um, all the guys funds, can like, you go play elsewhere and uh, it, it, it's like what could have been done to prevent this, you know? But maybe maybe this is just how things are. Like, human nature wants to speculate, and that's essentially what these people are doing. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, it was, um, you and I both started on Tasty Trade, uh, <laughs> sort of some of our education yeah. in finance, right? Yeah. And I had a conversation with Tom Sosnoff, and he is of the view that all of this is good right mm-hmm. like the so GameStop occurs that is good because it 
gets people interested in finance and you never know where that interest can lead. And I think that one of the things that like I've really been struggling with is the tension between like my uh, like almost boomer self and then like even way more boomer self, right? Where uh, like I hear Munger and Buffett talking to me and saying like, this is all just like bucket shop gambling type stuff. And then the, uh, the idea of like, well, you know, maybe this does get a lot of people interested and maybe they do tune into, you know, people like us and hopefully, you know, we can help them find like our perception of what the right answer is. I don't even know what, what right is. Right. Uh, I just know what I believe. Um, but it, it's been like, it's been a, a very, especially given what I went through last year, uh, with Robin hood. Like, I don't know. It's just, I, I feel very uneasy about all of this, but at the same time, um, coming back to what you said like i'm also uneasy about a ton of gatekeepers Mm -hmm. sometimes there's not really an easy answer right Mm -mm. yeah i mean i think to tom's point and yeah tasty trade was like my training grounds when i was figuring out how what options were and like what the market was um i think there's a better way to onboard people versus like what gme was like, I think it's okay because honestly, it got a lot of people talking about the market, it got a lot of people interested. Like I had friends texting me like, what's going on? Like, is this what you do for your job? <laughs> um, and like, do you work at <laughs> yeah. Citadel? Uh, and like that sort of stuff. I think it's like, at, at, the, at the end of the day, um, so for me, like I really struggle with the get rich quick mindset that seems to permeate a lot of how people think about investing. Like it's like, oh, I, you know, a thousand percent returns are nothing. And that's why a lot of people got into GameStop. It's because they were like, oh, I want a thousand percent returns. And then when GameStop started to crash, a lot of people got scared and got out of the market. So I don't think it's like, I don't think it was as good as it could have been. Like I, I think it was good in terms of raising awareness, but I think net net may be bad. Yeah. So do you like, you know, we, we probably speak to different demographics. I, I'm going to go out on a limb and say that. Uh, do you think that with your audience, if GameStop is going on, do, is there something in you that like, how do you fight the tension between not wanting to be the bearer of bad news, but also wanting to be like really honest with, with what your thoughts are on a situation? Oh, um, mm-hmm. I'm pretty honest. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Yeah, But uh, just internally, like, how do you think through that? Yeah. I mean, have you just said, I'm just going to do what I think is right. And that's my brand. And that's what I'm going to do. Yeah. I mean, so like I wrote a piece called meme stonks back when all of it was happening, like after I left cap group and I just talked about like how the market was really frothy and like, that's what's going on. Like, uh, this doesn't make sense, everybody. And it's okay that it doesn't make sense, but you need to probably like know that it doesn't make sense. So I just like, I'm just straight up with them. um, And I'm just like, hey, things are a little weird. And I talk a lot about tapering. I talk a lot about inflation. I talk a lot about monetary policy. And I'll let them know, like, this is also a little weird, everybody. And I think that when, right, like when you have somebody being like, hey, (laughs) this doesn't make sense to me either. um, That's, cool and good because rather than institutions or somebody else maybe being like this is exactly why x y and z is happening it's like hey um we're all in this together and being a little confused because everybody is a little confused so that's how i think about it i'm just like hear my thoughts so i don't i I could be wrong it could be the wrong way to do it but that's how i think about it yeah so do you think of yourself as almost like building in public in a way? I mean, I, I've said that about myself, like educating in public. I, I, mm. I do not have answers mm-hmm. necessarily. I just kind of have thoughts mm-hmm. and a desire to try to figure out answers. And I hope that people understand that that's where I'm coming from. Do you, is that sort of your approach as well? Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> like almost embarrassingly. So I um, like... Just from like, so like from a building perspective, you can look at my old videos and see like editing wise, like how, how bad they were. Uh, it's so just from even a formatting perspective, I've totally changed and I've been writing. So I've been 18. So what is that? Uh, five years. So I've been writing online for five years. And if you go and look at my old stuff, it's just like embarrassingly bad. Like I'm trying to explain the VIX and what the VIX means. Um, so for me, like building in public is super important because, uh, even though like sometimes feedback can be harsh from the audience, like this was dumb, this was uninteresting, um, I don't like how you explained it. 
it helps me. It helps me like recalibrate to what they want, what is most helpful. So yeah, building in public, I think is super important and it's really vulnerable. People just don't talk about that, like how vulnerable it is to sort of be a content creator. Cause you're like, I, like every time I tweet out a video, so most of my TikToks don't make it over to Twitter, but the ones that do, every time I tweet out a video, I'm like, I'm so nervous. I'm afraid somebody's gonna be like, you're totally wrong and you're the dumbest person ever. But it, even if they do that, I'm like, okay, I can learn from that. I can, you know, calibrate i keep on using that word but um yeah but yeah. that's what it is yeah it's just like yeah just calibrating to to the world um because i don't have all the answers i'm learning alongside my audience um so yeah building in public is key mm-hmm. all right i'm gonna ask you to put a pin in creator mental health and mm-hmm. then i'm gonna circle back to a different question then we're gonna go back this is a uh, sort of like tim ferris's parkour um <laughs> cool. so uh, I wanted you to, to think about, uh, or maybe riff on, um, let me make sure that I plug the pod correctly. It's the let's appreciate oh. pod. Oh, sure. Um, I liked your first episode. Collective belief is the new free cash flow. Yeah. And I think that it's interesting. I, I really liked listening to you talk about, um, just, just your general thoughts in that episode, but how you, how you said that you used to really like valuation <laughs> And you still do, yeah. but like there's this element that's going on outside of valuation that that you're paying a lot of attention to and whatnot. Um, that's yeah. that's like an interesting dynamic that's going on in your mind. Yeah, I mean, I used to be a hardcore like DC effort, <laughs> um, and I, like when I supported a portfolio manager at Cap Group, I was building out different models and like loved it. I was like, this is so cool! Like, look at me doing all my inputs. Um, and then once I left Cap Group and started like writing again, I was like, I don't think like valuation is super helpful, at least for my audience and sort of like the ideas that I want to get across. Right now, I'm more so leaning into like ideation. I still love valuation, like post them on Twitter. And when they post about valuation, I love it because it's super interesting. But for me, it's like, I think the ideation and the framework process is a lot more valuable to people versus being like, this is potentially what this company could trade at. And 50% of the time I'm going to be wrong because, um, you know, it's, it's super hard to, to tap that. Uh, so, yeah, that's kind of how. It, and I think also like the market is pretty detached from fundamentals, um, both in terms of like how easy the Fed has been with policy. And then in terms of how these companies are trading and like the multiples that they're trading at, like it's like there has to be some sort of compression eventually. And I, I don't know what that'll be like. I, I don't know anything else more than anybody else around that. So I don't think that valuation is my competency. So I just am like, I'm just not going to do it anymore um, to an extent. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Does your do you think that your audience thinks that the market is detached from sort of reality or fundamentals or whatever? Uh, yeah, I think most people do that, at least in yeah. my yeah, general circle, just because like when you, you know, when you look at the economy, like the economy is, you know, recovering, quote unquote, we still we have a massive labor shortage. We have massive supply chain issues. And yet the stock market keeps on ticking up. Like even when Afghanistan, like the bombing happened last week, the market was just like totally just not even really paying attention. It just keeps on going up. Uh, and like, it's fine, I guess, you know, I can't fault it. Sorry about that siren. No, um, it's all good. We can we can always edit that out. Yeah, uh, raped by a hospital. Um, <laughs> well, then we'll just continue to keep it in. It's not a problem. <laughs> yeah, um, but yeah, I mean, I think the market is to an extent detached from fundamentals. Like a lot of companies are sort of trading at, like I said, these multiples that don't really make sense, but maybe they do make sense. Like maybe this is just a new normal. And I think that's kind of hard to like wrap your head around too, is like maybe this all makes sense, but it doesn't make sense. Yeah. Yeah. Super intuitive. I, <laughs> I, no, I, I actually think that that is a very, very good way to summarize what I think about what's going on is that it makes sense, but it doesn't make any sense. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. and I guess that it's, it's just so um, heavily reduced my faith of being able to forecast anything ac- like precisely, right? It's just like, I have no idea what's going to happen. None. Yeah. Don't know. There could be another pandemic next year. Like who the hell knows? Yeah. If, if 2020 taught me anything, it's that I don't know what might come and I have no idea what the policy response will be. And I have no idea how people like, I don't know if you've seen, but do you follow retail sales? Yeah. Yeah. They've exploded, like exploded. And I'm not just talking about like on a 
Yeah. If you had told me we're going to have a, a global pandemic and the U.S. consumer would come out in incredibly great shape, I'd be like, this makes no sense. But it does make sense. Yeah. Yeah. But like there's so no way. Yeah. You could have never put that into your valuation framework. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. Right. Or like ahead of time projected that like I just I wouldn't it wouldn't have been within my realm of competence. I, Do you think that the people. Sorry. What? No, I was just going to say, I don't think anybody could have predicted that. And that's like the weird yeah, thing about right? the markets is like, we're trying to predict the unpredictable, essentially. And like, there's value to yeah. that. Like, I think somebody needs to sort of have these guardrails in place for, for stocks and companies. But like, at the end of the day, you can't hang your hat on it and be like, yeah, I was 100% correct. Because it's just like, the probability <laughs> of that is super, super low. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So now you spend a lot of time on crypto and NFTs, if I'm not mistaken. Is yeah. that fair? Yes. Yeah, it's super fair. <laughs> so uh, what do you see going on there? Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm super interested. In I know that this is like a super broad question, but if you can <laughs> narrow it down for my audience, who I assume does not spend as much time on it as you do. Yeah, I've written about it quite a bit. Uh, and the, the sub stacks always turn into YouTube. So um, I've written a lot about like the ownership economy, which I think is kind of what's going on here. We're like trying to own the online and crypto is the way that people are thinking about that. So <clears throat> moving into this like Web3 economy, into this world where um, stuff is digital, right? So like how do you own in a digital space? And we've never really owned the online space. Like it's always been owned by platforms like Twitter owns the IP, um, Instagram owns the IP. It, so this is the way where people are trying to become owners of what they do online. And NFTs right now, like I think the reason that they're so wacky is there's like FOMO, like people want to get involved because they see other people doing it. It's feedback loops. Like if you see people making millions and millions of dollars, you're like, I too would love to make millions of dollars. Like, let me join. Um, and so I think it's a lot of that stuff where people are just trying to get in on the action and the market is calibrating to that. And I do like everybody's like money laundering. Sure. Yeah, there's probably money laundering going on. Like, that's everything. That's traditional finance, too. Um, yeah. yeah, I don't know how different that is from, like, it's, traditional art. Yeah, it's not. But people use that as sort of, like, a excuse. Like, when I made a video about NFTs for TikTok, like, uh, probably every other comment was, like, they're just money laundering. And I'm like, sure, okay. <laughs> but like, it's, it's a broader message. It's, like, people are trying to figure out what's going on. And through that, like, there's going to be euphoria. Yeah. I mean, do you, um, how do you think through like whether or not, um, I, I guess that the question that I'm really trying to ask is like a hype cycle question, mm. because I think like I have noticed myself really pissed off that I don't have a bored ape. Like mm -hmm. I don't like that. Mm -hmm. Um, but then I don't want to go get the pudgy penguin cause I don't want a penguin. Damn it. I want an ape. Yeah. But then I'm like, I don't have enough money to get an ape. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and like I, th I have noticed that um, I, I feel I, at first I disregarded this trend. Mm -hmm. Now I'm like, no, this is definitely real. I just don't know how real it is. Mm -hmm. So like it reminds me of some of these cycles that kind of have like a bunch of hype and then we'll probably have like a crash period. And that's when you really want to like know what's going on to pick up some of the pieces. That's how my mind has framed it. But um how do you see, you know, how do you predict the future, Kyla? <laughs> Which I'm sure you can't do. Yeah, no, if I could, uh, my life would probably be a little different. Um, but yeah, <laughs> uh, no, I mean, I think like this happens in crypto a lot. Like you had DeFi summer. This happened in NFTs a little bit back in 2017 with crypto kitties. It's just um, like the market will shake out what doesn't make sense. And right now it's um, NFTs don't make a whole lot of sense. Uh, to a certain extent, right? Like there are rocks selling for, you know, $3 million. And I think a lot of it has to do with crypto funds. So a lot of like VC arms are getting into crypto and they're going to throw money at stuff because they can, because that's how it's, you know, that's just the market environment for private markets right now. And also you have crypto billionaires. So a lot of very, very rich people in crypto um, may not know what to do with their crypto money. So they're going to throw it at rock because if you have this rock and you can show it on your like, platform and put it as your profile picture on Twitter, everybody knows that you're a rock. Everybody knows that you're a pudgy penguin. Everybody knows that you're a bored ape. And so there's this like community aspect to it too, where it's like, 
I get to be a part of the board ape community. I get to show everybody that I did this, that I'm there, that I'm with it. Um, so I think it's a lot of that stuff too. Like we, like it's really interesting. So ever since the industrial revolution, we've been a really individualistic society. We've always operated in the mind of the individual because that's what you do, sort of as like a factory worker. And ever since then, like sort of leaning into the knowledge economy, it's just become very, very siloed. But I think crypto sort of is like kind of turning that on its head where it's more so a focus on community and we don't really know what that means and so we're trying to figure that out too like okay why would i pay money for this thing but it's really access right like it's really access into the board ape club um and it's like a yeah. very fancy digital country club which 2 p.m wrote a really good piece on it's like this digital country club that you're paying access to yeah yeah i like that and um you know, I, I, I realize that we may even need to take a step back and frame this uh, mm-hmm. like even even more basic. So an NFT for people that mm-hmm. don't know is a non-fungible token. Mm-hmm. Um, Board Ape Yacht, Yacht Club is basically uh, it's a group of, I guess, creators that are artists that have uh, released a number of apes and they look bored mm-hmm. and they have eyeballs on them and stuff like that. And uh you, you can only own one digital copy of it. And I, I guess that the, you know, the biggest pushback that I've ever heard is like, I have a board ape on my phone, right? I just snapped a picture on the internet. It looks as good as the NFT that somebody actually owns. But like, I wouldn't dare use that as my profile picture on Twitter because one, it would, it would violate a code that I'm not trying to violate. And two, a swarm of people would probably go nuts on me. Um, for you know like the right reasons it's it's interesting that like i feel a social responsibility to honor someone else's contract because i know it's an nft so i won't co-op that picture i never that's like odd to me but it's also real yeah yeah it's- and like there's a lot of like interesting dynamics interpersonally that are going on within the online community and nfts are one of those things Mm -hmm. yeah it's a social code um and i like yeah you you know that people you know it's not cool like to do that i think a lot of people do um somebody tweeted out last night like i stole this 5.3 million dollar rock i think it was or it was it was a picture of an nft and they tweeted it out in like a bunch of people in the comments were just dragging this person. And they're like, yeah. you know, like you, this is not what that means. Like, because when you have an NFT, it's own, like the ownership is verified by the blockchain. So you can, sure, you have the picture, but really what an NFT is the pointer to the asset. It's this narrative behind the asset. Um, it's not always the asset themselves. So you can download the picture, sure, but you don't own it. Like the person who owns the pointer to the asset does, and that's only verified on the blockchain. So if you don't have access to that, it doesn't matter. You can download, copy it, print it, paste it all over town, but it's not yours. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I, and I know people that say, well, who cares that it's not <laughs> yours? But the fact of the matter is like some people really care. Yeah. Well, sure. I mean, like it's the same with like getting prints of the Mona Lisa. Like you can't go to a guy in the pawn shop and be, like show him a print and be like, hey, um, I'm going to sell this to you. It's the original Mona Lisa because obviously it's not verified. You don't have ownership over that. It's the same thing just in the digital space. Um, you can't just try and sell a copy of a JPEG on OpenSea because people are going to be like, where's the verification? And you won't have it. So yeah, I think I think a lot of people just struggle with the concept of it, right? And it's tough. It's tough to like why, why are these JPEGs, these pings, these, these pictures selling for millions and millions of dollars? Um, because it's something that we've never really faced before. And I think that's the big issue is we're like, what does this mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I, you know, I guess that, uh, like, I think it's interesting that I think a lot of the people who are poo-pooing NFTs are the same types of people that poo-poo a lot of new trends. And I guess I kind of understand why they're doing it. But I also think that they're not paying attention to how big this is. Like, how much time and how many inbounds do you get about NFTs? Like, how much time do you spend on it? Oh, man. Um, I spent a lot of time on it this past week just because I was more curious about it than anything. Um, I use, I usually just, like, with my work, I'm just like, what do I want to learn about? And then I just share my process with people. Um 
I get a lot of pings around different NFT projects asking if I want to be a part of it. Um, I get a lot of people like pinging me their ideas for NFT projects. Uh, I read a lot about different NFT projects. Um, so this past week, I would say I probably spent it's 25 hours just like reading about them, trying to learn more, um, talking to people who are building in the space. Yeah, because I'm not a builder, right? Like I'm just more of a curator of content of information. So I really want to make sure I'm getting like the right stories out there for people. Yeah. Yeah. How much, uh, I know I keep going back to this pressure question, but I, but I want to go back to the mental health thing of being a creator. Like, what do you think, um, what's the hardest thing about being always on? You're always on. Because I, I, that's what I perceive you to be. I, I, and I know that I feel that at times too. It's like, I, I feel like I'm always kind of doing a little bit of performance art, which is kind of odd to say out loud, but it is true. Yeah. I mean, I, it can just be a little tiring. Um, like you sort of have to remain consistent across all the different platforms and like be this, like, so for me, like I put on a persona when I make my videos, I'm not that like outgoing really. I'm an introvert. And so a lot of people think I'm like extroverted. And, um, like, I think the toughest part for me is just like managing all the different platforms that I'm on and dealing with like different questions or like um, really lucky to have like different requests for videos but all of that does add up and I think a lot of people don't realize like this is a one person team uh, <laughs> um, I'm doing like everything from HR to editing to um, you know ideation to processing everything that is in yeah and in, 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 um, so I think it's a little bit tough with that is like people expect a lot from you all the time um and sometimes you can't deliver like i actually had to take a step back on tiktok because i was making a video every single day and it was like a market update or it was a skit or something and i had to take a step back from the market updates because i just was um like just was like i i can't deliver on this in the way that i want to to the audience in the best way possible and so i ended up like stepping back and it it felt okay but it just like kind of you're always thinking about it too. Like you're always like, oh, I got to edit this. So oh, I got to write that. And it's great. Like I, don't, I, I love it, but um, I'm always doing something. Like there's never any downtime because there can't be because you always have to be producing because if you don't produce, people might forget about you. And if people forget about you, like, you know, it's over. Um, so that I think that's like the worst part. And also you're like you kind of said earlier, you're subject to the opinions of people. So if you fall out of fever, um, game over you know and that's really scary too you're you know that's scary the public is scary uh yeah yeah so I, th I think that's the worst part let me ask you something do you honestly think it would be over if people just stopped paying attention to you as a creator no i mean like so for me creator is not going to be my for everything i have a lot of ideas that i want to work on around financial education like building products in the space so for me this is just it's just something fun um and if i'm helping people that's good but i do think there's like this internal pressure that i put on myself as a perfectionist to really um be on for people all the time uh, so if people like get bored of me which is inevitable um that, that will probably happen at some point hopefully not soon but yeah you just have to know it might happen mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know that people are going to get bored of oh. you. I, I <laughs> happen you. to think that you are uh, quite talented at what you do. I and I that. and I think that you bring like, um, it's a very fresh and, and very like, uh, I, what you do is very hard to do. I, you know, I, I can't recall off the top of my head right now when, um, when I, I, uh, DM'd you the, uh, you had a, t it, it was like a TikTok video about NFTs and, and there was no, uh, What's the amendment that was proposed for Bitcoin or something? Oh, and the infrastructure it was bill? very big. Yeah. 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 What was going on with that? Oh, with the infrastructure bill, like it was basically a pay pay for. So what um, they just threw in this. So the big infrastructure bill that's being passed under Biden, um, one of the senators threw in this like crypto pay for. So they were going to tax crypto uh, people, it, it, but they were going to tax everybody as a broker. So tax individuals, tax everybody under a broker, but you can't do that, right? Because like, you're not you know, registered as a broker, like you can't meet that demand. And so the, it was very, very clear that 
the people who are making this amendment in the infrastructure bill had no idea how crypto worked, and yet they were still making policy around it. And so it turned into this really big thing where um, somebody proposed to um, widen, uh, I forgot their names, Toomey, I think was one of them, but like a couple more uh, people proposed an, another amendment to the bill and it kind of went back and forth. And then of course, like because it's politics, it ended up going through under the original uh, amendment. And um, yeah, so, it was just really messy. And it, I think, you know, legislation <coughs> brings validation to this space, but it also made it really clear that a lot, a lot of legislation has not been developed around crypto. And I think that is something that a lot of people are going to have to think about. And a lot of the big crypto companies are thinking about it and developing lobbyists. But, you know, it was very apparent that they had no idea what they were doing. And that's not good. And they're going to have to know what they're doing. And once they figure out what they're doing, there's going to be a lot more, uh, how do you say, like guardrails in place, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, watching the, uh, you know, the interviews of the big tech companies, Mm -hmm. I'm not sure Congress knows what they're doing with big tech and they've had a long time to figure it out. So I'm, I'm not optimistic about crypto, but we'll sort of see where they all come come out no i uh, which yeah. is to say i'm not optimistic on them becoming informed enough to have like reasonable regulations that's the actual thought that i have it, it, i'm i agree with you um yeah that's like a whole different conversation about i mean politics. it moves so fast right so pre- it so does. like thinking that, that they're gonna move equally as fast is like they can't. They're just gonna be left behind. Yeah, I have a couple. I have a lot of friends who are like full time in crypto space, and they I, like I try and get updates from them on like what's going on because I personally like I'm trying to keep tabs on the stock market, the crypto market, um, and like policy. Uh, so I, I tend to lean on them, and they're just like it's going at, at the speed of freaking light. So yeah, it's the space is phenomenally fast. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I want to go back to this mental health thing. Sure. Uh, how do you manage your dopamine intake? Oh my God, that's something I thought about a lot because I love clicking on that little bell on Twitter and being like, oh, what are people saying? Do people, like, do people yeah. like it? Yeah. Um, so I, I'm pretty bad about it. Uh, I, I check Twitter. I, I don't click on the bell if I'm on Twitter and, like, until the end of my Twitter time. So I, I manage it huh. that way. Yeah. Um, so that's that way smart. I can like, respond. Yeah. Um, so that way I'm not like, I, I go on Twitter to learn, uh, which I know sounds like silly, but. I go in there and I follow no, it people. Doesn't. Yeah, I, I think it's how it's I really... train my. It's how I learned like most of what I know is through Twitter, actually. Same. Yeah, like there's some amazing, amazing thinkers on there. So I, I just read usually, like they'll link different articles and I'll read. So that's how I structure my Twitter time. And then at the very end, it's like time for me to respond to people who are talking at me. Um, and then same with TikTok. Like I'll watch my TikToks and then I'll respond to everybody at the end of my TikTok time. So I, I do try and segment my time, <laughs> my TikTok. I sound like I'm like <laughs> talking to a baby. Like it's, it's my Twitter time, my TikTok time. Um, but yeah, so that's how I, I tend to structure it is uh, in, in segments, yeah. Well, I think the thing that's, um, that I have had difficulty with, and it could be a generational thing, but um, you know, one of the things that's hard is you're, you're putting your content onto something that is inherently addictive uh, and, and maybe inherently is a little bit too big of a word, but, uh, I don't think that big tech is not addictive. So okay. like, okay, all of a sudden I put out something on Twitter. How do I not get sucked into the Twitter verse? Right. And like you're on TikTok, which is insanely addictive. It's bad. So there's like an element of like having to go into the, um, right into the fire in order to even get your content distributed. So I would think it's very difficult. Yeah. No, um, and so you also have to like, for me and like kind of the videos that I make, I have to stay up to date on like what, sh- what people are talking about on Twitter too. So I can't always go like with this sort of like learner first mindset. I also have to be like digging around and being like, okay, like this is what people are saying about this. This is what people are saying about that. Um, and then TikTok, TikTok is just so goofy. And because the algorithm figures you out so fast, it shows you what you like. And so like, I'm, I love absurd, like a, absurd humor is my favorite thing. So like, it'll be like jalapenos dancing to like a Pitbull song. And that'll be like on my, on my For You page. And I love that kind of stuff. But you have to be so, like, that's Seems so bad. Seems pretty funny. I get it. <laughs> it's great. But like, you can't, you know, you, 
you can like laugh and, and then you can scroll along. But I, I've tried to design my page to be like a little bit more substantial. But I mean, you can tell like my content has gotten probably more absurd over time. Like people, people sometimes comment like, are you on drugs? Like, <laughs> uh, that sort of thing. So uh, you can tell that I, I do get influenced by TikTok. Yeah. So I, I try to use everything as a tool to like make my stuff better and learn from it. Like I learn a lot from other content creators on TikTok on like what makes sense. Like how do you structure these videos to appease the algorithm? And same with Twitter. Like hmm. if people are talking about a certain thing, I'm like, okay, the algo might pick that up. Twitter's algorithm isn't as powerful as TikTok's. But yeah, that's kind of how I think about it. Mm hmm. hmm. I uh, I should probably try to tailor my stuff a little more to the algo, but I just kind of do my own thing, which is why I'm not as good at this as you are. <laughs> no, I mean, it, at the end of the day, you just want to have fun. And like, I, I would say I do my own thing mostly, um, but it just tilts towards what other people tend to be also thinking about. Yeah. Well, the reason that I ask is there's, you know, um, you strike me as someone who's independent, um, you know, you said you came from Kentucky and that mm -hmm. you had an interest, uh, that was not necessarily, it doesn't sound like where you're from was super into finance generally, right? You started writing on the internet in order to find other people that had similar interests. Um, and then you find yourself in the middle of sort of a whirlwind of how do I talk about what other people are talking about? And, you know, I really like valuation and I like models, but also that's not really what I do. And it, it just seems like you uh, have a lot of um, potential tensions in your life from uh, what you do as a business standpoint to what you sort of maybe as uh, an independent introvert might spend a different amount of time on. I don't know. So managing that must be a chore. Eh, I don't know. I mean, like, for me, like the videos and the, I love my newsletter. Like my newsletter is probably the favorite thing I do. Um, and then with the TikToks, like it's a very creative outlet for like, it's, it's starting where should people that. sign up for your newsletter while we're talking it, about it? Yeah. It's kyla.substack.com. Yeah. So sign up there. It's somebody was like, Oh, a self-titled newsletter. Somebody thinks really highly of themselves. And I was like, I just didn't know what else to call it. Like, I'm not trying to flex. <laughs> <laughs> Silly. <laughs> and that's another thing. People will comment the first thing that comes to their mind on like the videos. And yeah, like one guy was like, Oh my God, your vocal fry is making my brain fry. And I was like, ah, like, it's just, yeah, it's super funny. Like dealing with some of the comments. One guy was like, um, now that you're smiling less, I can watch your videos more. You reminded me of the Joker. And I was like, <laughs> what? <laughs> well, I, I don't, just... <laughs> that seems kind of rude. I think you have a nice smile for what it's worth. <laughs> Thank you. Um, it was you just, don't, you but... don't remind me of a serial killer when you smile. Well, yeah, that was like the worst part. It was like the Joker. Oh my God. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's some yeah. dark stuff. Yeah, well, and that can get into your head, like speaking to the mental health point, like you're like, oh, maybe like, wow, like, should I be smiling less? Like, wow, is it really entitled of me to name my lose newsletter after myself? Like, um, like, do I have vocal fry? Um, which I do a little bit because I'm, you know, a young 20s female and that's just how what you do. But what um, is vocal fry? It's, it's, I don't know, actually. I don't think I have okay. it, but apparently I do. It's just like, apparently you drop your voice to a lower barometer than what you're sp supposed to be speaking at. And the oh. it's kind of like Paris Hilton, Kim Kardashian, like that kind of, like, oh my God. Ah, oh, fuck this yeah. guy. I, I don't that's know. I don't like this guy. If <laughs> no, you listen but... and you're my fan, stop listening. I don't want you as a fan. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know. That's kind of the thing too. It's like, uh, you can choose what content you consume and if you don't like my content like you don't have to consume it but but speaking to the mental health point like those comments can be a little hard to um wade through sometimes especially if you're having a bad day and you go on tiktok and somebody's co comparing you to the joker you're just like all right time to log off you know and you have to know <laughs> yeah. when to log off yeah. yeah yeah has it ever impacted your sleep oh like uh, <laughs> just the whole job and always being on um <laughs> Uh, I, I'm a little like time management has been a little tough for me recently. So I haven't been sleeping probably as much as I should be. I also struggle with, with sleeping, um, a lot. So yeah, yeah. Not, and I'm trying to like? optimize. Uh, I wake up really early and sort of putter around a lot and work on different things. Um, with having a full-time job that was relatively demanding. 
uh, it was just tough to like squeeze in the content, squeeze in the editing. And um, now I've got it down to more of a science, but when I was still trying to figure out like how to make content, it would take me a long time to make a video. And especially if I'm like working with brands and they have a certain deadline and I also have my full-time job in like, yeah, that, that it just like, it just made it tough from a management perspective. Yeah. Yeah. I ask, I mean, I, w I went through it, uh, for a while I was waking up at like, you know, one thirty or two at night and it was almost like habitual that I'd go reach for my phone. And then I was like, what the hell is going on with me? Yeah. Like what have I, I've, I've like trained myself like a dog to be addicted to this phone. This is insane, mm -hmm. but it was real. Yeah. No, same, same. Um, I usually, I wake up sometimes around like four. That's usually when I wake up and, and the first thing I do is, is check the phone. Um, usually my emails are first, but, uh, and then I'll start like editing a video. So yeah, now I'm right yeah. there with you. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's wild. I don't know. It, yeah. We, we, I think we are. Trained, I mean, I like Pablo for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess that, um, I mean, what do you think it does to people's investment horizons? Or, well, I guess a better way and a less leading way to, to frame it would be, does it do anything to people's investment horizons when we're sort of like always at a screen, it feels like, and people mm -hmm. are, I don't know, at, at least like I, my perception of what I have gotten myself involved in, and I'm, I'm curious whether or not you feel the same, is like all day long, people are just arguing about ideas. And I happen to like walk into an arena that they're doing it in. And sometimes I'm like, why am I walking into this? And does this actually help my behavior? Mm -hmm. Or does it get me all short term focused? And I'm just, I'm not sure what the answer is. Cause on one hand, Twitter has objectively made me smarter. Mm -hmm. On the other, there may be a lot of ways it's making me dumber and I'm not sure about it. Yeah, no, same. I mean, like, I'll sometimes, if there's, like, Twitter beef going on, I'm like, yeah, what's going on here? <laughs> so, yeah, I, I, <laughs> we tend to seek that kind of stuff out. And then, like, to the, the point of short term, oh, yeah, that's something I think about a lot, too. Like, it's this get-rich-quick mindset that I think permeates a lot of us. It's like, well, I don't have five years to hold on to this stock. I want my money now. Um, and we're kind of used to that. Like we have instant gratification all throughout our society. And so the concept in like, especially with crypto sort of being like, so when you put crypto and then like stocks next to one another, it's like crypto, I can make a 10,000% return or more. Why would I hold on to my stock that might give me a dividend of $1? Um, so yeah, it's, it's, I think it's tough. I think it's really tough to, and also humans are pretty bad about thinking in term in long-term perspectives. Um, we operate on the short term most of the time. So I do think that's part of the problem. And then with Twitter, uh, everybody wants, the, with, 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 with Twitter, like, it's just so many ideas all the time. And so you can get FOMO also. And I think yeah. that that doesn't help. Like one person, you could read one second, buy the stock, read another second, sell the stock. There's just so many opinions on the platform and that can be tough to parse through, yeah. Do you think that, it, is it a stretch to say that younger people are more interested in options in crypto than they've ever been? Like, do you uh, think that would be an accurate thing to say? Maybe. I mean, like when I was doing options when I was 18, <laughs> there was nobody who I knew that was also doing that. Um, now there's a ton of 18 year olds, 15 year olds in crypto and doing options. So I think maybe on the aggregate, yes. And also like Robinhood, right? Like there's a lot more accessibility to the this stuff than there used to be. Um, like Robinhood makes it so you can download and, and get an account and you can start trading. Uh, that really reduces the barriers. So I think it maybe it's not even interest, but accessibility uh, and information has become more uh, accessible. Yeah. Yeah. The, the other thing that uh, Tom Saznoff had said to me that I thought it, it like jarred my brain. I wasn't ready to hear it. Mm. But after thinking on it, I, I understand what he was saying because he's a market maker by, de by trade, right? And he said, you know, people don't trade stocks anymore. They're, they're too expensive. Mm -hmm. And I didn't understand what he meant. And then he said, you know, if, um, if a stock is $600, that's, that's capital inefficient. And mm -hmm. I still didn't get it. And then I was like, oh, if you view everything as inventory, Mm -hmm. then the amount of capital that goes into your inventory, that's obviously like that. It's so obvious that it would be capital inefficient, but I don't view 
stocks as inventory, right? I, I view them as like ownership interests in businesses. So it's really what's the price relative to the earnings. But I sort of wonder how much of what's going on in Robinhood and options and crypto is just people moving inventory. I really right? and like yeah. how many people are just trading. Yeah. No, the invent that's a really interesting idea. So I think that's Time. kind of what's going on. People are like, I have a set amount of dollars and like sort of getting away from the valuation frameworks. It's more so like I have a certain amount of money and I need to allocate it across the board here. And I don't have time to, uh, you know, to spend it on a stock. So, yeah, I would say that's probably a pretty accurate representation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you um, I mean, do you where where do you view your brand going over time? Do you think you're going to stay more in like the macro thing? Do you think that you want to I mean, I know you said you want to build out like financial content and stuff, but mm -hmm. just kind of what what what's your passion? Yeah. Uh, everything. And it's kind of cool because I get to explore everything. I really love private markets. I love startups. I, I want to like tell. So the way that I kind of started thinking about myself, and I don't know if like it makes sense, but like a librarian um, and like a historian almost. So like with crypto, I want to chronicle like what's happening in crypto through my videos. And so like that's mm. my goal with crypto is like to piece by piece talk about the space. So like I'll make a video on NFTs and explaining what they are. And then I'll make another video on NFTs like a couple months later. And I think like sort of capturing the sentiment there will, will be kind of cool. And also through my writing, like having having those like broader ideas. And that's kind of why I've shifted towards like broader ideas. Number one, it's more fun. Uh, and then number two, because I love philosophy. So I get to like look at everything through a more philosophy lens. Um, so being like sort of a crypto historian, a crypto li librarian, and then also with the broad market, um, just doing analysis around it and trying to break down concepts to my audience and to people who read uh, like some of these bigger ideas and, and how they can sort of incorporate it or that sort of stuff. So I want to stay broad. I, I think it's really fun to stay broad um, and just be chatting about everything with everybody. And also telling the stories of like startups in, in financial education or like the creator economy, two things that I'm really passionate about and helping them get the word out. Like, yeah, yeah, this, that's what I want to do. What do you think is going to go on with the creator economy? Like I, I have, um, I can't see it slowing down on one hand, but on the other hand, there's a, uh, there's like a lot of people out there that must be like right on the verge of quitting <laughs> because it's really, really tough. And I think like Brutal. something that you said that really makes sense is like none of us know how each other is priced and you start talking to somebody and you're like, oh, well, how did you price that? Oh, that sucks. I didn't get that. Like whatever. Um, it, it's going to be interesting to see how that evolves and how um, how, how do we, we got to figure out a way to have our data set so that we can sort of fight back against the, uh, people that have data on us. Yeah. So I think there's like, you know, there's a couple of points there. Number one. So like, like, okay. So number one would be these brands that are creating tools for creators. And then number two would be like the trade pay transparency with the, so working backwards, like the pay transparency we just talked about, there's a couple of platforms like, um, that are like F you pay me and I think another one that are becoming the glass store for creators. And so that way there's more, you know, bargaining power with brands because right now it's the wild west out there. Um, I've gotten on a couple of calls and like given my pricing structure and people have been like, oh my God, you're so cheap. Um, and I'm like, what? And then Kel like, <laughs> Damn what <you>. would you, <laughs> yeah. And then like, don't raise it for me, but raise it moving forward. And I'm like, oh, this sucks. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> um, so definitely pricing is super hard. And then you'll have some creators that are priced like out the wazoo and brands will pay it. Uh, so it's really odd. And I think also like the negotiation, like I hate talking about pricing with brands. I'm just like, I, I do, don't do this for free. Uh, so like that, that's tough. Um, and then also like with the broader creator economy, I do think there's like a little bit of euphoria going on here. So you have a lot of brands that are building in the space uh, and they're like not talking to creators. Like I'll get on a call with, with a brand that's like, oh, like, do you want to use our product? And I'm like, have you interviewed any creators around this product? Like, is this something that people have asked for? And they're like, no, no, we just want to build. And they've raised like $3 million or something like some, some crazy amount of money. Um, and it's just like people are just funneling money. Like if you say the word creator, people are like, yeah, I want a piece of that. Um, and, and, and then the product is like terrible um, to say the least. And so I think there's there's a lot of uh, room for creator owned 
products moving forward because people who are not creators, it's, it's tough to like make a product for creators if you have not talked to creators. Like, I know it sounds crazy, but that's how it is. Yeah, like you have to probably talk to creators if you want to make a product for them. Yeah, that's right. I, I mean, I know that I'm like a stand for Twitter, but uh, I've, I've gotten to talk to their product team and mm. I, I hope that I'm like giving them value in doing so. Uh, something that just came out, I don't know, are, are you up to speed on Super Follows or do you know what's yeah. like what they're trying to do there? I know a little bit, yeah. Yeah, like I, this idea of um, a Super Follower badge. So if I send out a tweet and I have Super Followers, public, like so for people that don't know, Super Followers have a private feed on Twitter. It's like a Twitter Plus, think of. And then uh, as a creator, I would have that feed that I run, and then I have a public feed. Uh, on the public feed, they're saying that my super followers, when they reply, would have a little badge that says, like, I super follow this guy. I don't think I like that. Mm-mm. I think th- I think that should not be the default, at least. I think a user should have the ability to turn that on and off. Because I don't want to, like, create some weird dynamic weird. within my follower mm-hmm. base. Yeah. You know, or like somebody's like, oh, that's so dumb. You super follow Kylo. Like, why would you do that? And then people are like, ah, it just seems like peacocking in a way that I don't really need to get involved in. Yeah. Buy an NFT, folks. Yeah, no, I, I agree. <laughs> uh, I would not. I, I don't even think I, if, if it's available, I haven't opted into it. But um, yeah, I, I wouldn't want that. Um, it, it's an interesting concept, I think. And like, it would be a good alternative to Patreon. I don't have a Patreon, but like it'd be a good alternative to that. I think for people who do have large Twitter audiences and you're like, okay, I've gathered like all these, like Twitter is my most powerful platform by far in terms of just like engagement. More but, so than TikTok? Mm-hmm. I'm actually kind of small really? for TikTok. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, uh, that's not right. People help her out. <laughs> no, no. It's, 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 I'm, I'm a finance content creator. It doesn't get great for us. Um, I'm not that yeah, interesting. It's not as look. sexy as dancing, to be fair, yeah. for the algorithm. <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's okay. Um, I, I do want to get bigger, and I'm working on it, but uh, yeah. And I also, I, I speak to intermediate investors more so than beginner investors, so I make my TAM yeah. smaller, than it, smaller than it should be, probably. Um, but yeah, uh, and then also that, that algorithm is just nuts. Uh, but yeah, with Twitter, it would be cool to do that. But I don't want people underneath my tweets being like, I super follow you or feeling weird that they have that badge next to their name and then not wanting to talk to me at all. Um, that would yeah. be cool. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I think, too. Or have some dynamic where like, um, I don't know, you like as as I would feel like if I saw the badge that I had to, I don't know, either respond to them and then that could like come at the expense of other people. And the mm-hmm. whole idea is to not do that. Mm-hmm. So what my feedback to Twitter was, is I just said like, look, let people turn it on and off. As far as super follows go, I'm already going to have a private conversation for them. So like they're going to get more engagement anyway. I don't understand why it's got to be so public. So we'll see. But it go- I, what I'm saying, I think, goes to your point on talking to the actual creators. And what I will give credit to Twitter for is they've changed a lot of things since mm-hmm. not because of me, but as I've seen people give them feedback, this whole building yeah. in public is, is helpful. I think. Yeah. Yeah. No, they've definitely been figuring it out for a bit. Um, and they do seem like they're moving a little bit faster. Like spaces seems has been really good for a lot of people. Fleets was do you do fleeting. Spaces? I don't know. Um, I no. Mm-mm. I don't. I've been do on you a view couple. yourself. You're, you're more visual than audio, yeah? Yeah, and I'm just like, I don't have that many interesting things to say every day. I'd rather just like package it all up real nice and then get it out to you. I don't want to be there every day just chattering. Um, but I know a lot of people who do it, and they're really interesting to listen to. But for me, um, it's I, I need a little bit of a break from just being like on, 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 on. Yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. I would think so. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that's I, I you know, that. I got to ask you this, I, and if it sucks, we'll just cut it. But what's it like to be a woman and be out there? Like, do you get harassed at all? Or are, like, people fairly, um, you know, well-behaved? Yeah, that's the reason I wouldn't want super follows. Um, and I, yeah. a private feed does not sound like it would be fun for me. Um, huh, that sucks. 
No, I mean, like, it's not that bad. It's, just, it's really not. But um, I do get some weird DMs. Um, <clears throat> and, I, like, the thing I struggle with is, like, and it's so of silly, but it's like, are they listening to me because I'm me? Or are they listening to me because I'm a woman? And or are they not listening to me because I'm a woman? I don't know. And so I think you kind of just think about it a little bit more. Um, and you do have some weirdos who are in your DMs every day, just sort of developing a parasocial relationship, which can be a little scary. Um, but on the aggregate, I don't... Can you define parasocial just so I understand exactly what you're saying? So they think that they know you because, I mean, yeah. the th thing with my videos and being on Twitter, which is a primarily text-based platform, a lot of people have seen my face and they've seen my reactions and they've seen how I talk. So they think that they know me a lot better than I know anybody else. Like, I haven't seen a lot of people even talking on, like, I've never seen them talk. I've never seen their face. I've only ever seen their profile picture. But for me, because I'm so in everybody's face <laughs> with my videos and, like, my expressions and how I act as a person like it's so personal right to like watch a video of somebody doing these things that I do and so a parasocial relationship is like oh I know her she knows me um and we're friends but I have no idea who they are uh and I don't plan on like knowing them probably so it, it kind of creates a weird dynamic and a lot of creators really struggle with that yeah even like for me like the YouTube videos that I watch like I really like Cody Ko who's like a YouTube commentary person um, and I probably think that I know him, right, to a certain extent, but yeah. he has no idea. He has no idea who I am. So it's just like kind of that weirdness. Like, you know a lot about them, you know their life, but they don't know anything about you. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's right. And I would think as an introvert, um, <laughs> it, I, I would think that doesn't help, right? Uh, like, most of, I mean, it's like I, I, I've become, I'm able to filter it out and just be like, oh, you know. Uh, as long as they're not like I had one person that did threaten to like stalk me and that was like a little Ooh, uh, get out of here um to block <laughs> you know uh, <laughs> Ooh, I don't like you yeah not, I'm, I mean uh, not that that yeah no we're gonna say we don't like that person that's fine that's no, fine terminology yeah. yeah so um that was probably the worst experience but other than that like people like I would say on aggregate like people are so supportive people are so nice I get a lot of really nice DMs being like I love your content you're super good don't stop and when you get a DM like that where somebody's like do not stop making content it, that feels really good so I would rather get like you know for every bad DM I get if I get like 10 good DMs that's okay yeah 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 well, I'll tell you what, like, I think Jason Buck is a cool dude. I like Corey Hofstein a lot. Yeah. Me, Corey, and Jason have all commented about your stuff oh. in ways that, like, we all really appreciate what you do, and we think that you got, like, a real talent. Thank so you. to the extent that you like any of the three of us, you uh, you have our full-blown endorsement. Uh, if you don't like any of the three of us, I, I can't help you. I don't know what to no. tell you. <laughs> no, no. I, I, Corey's an OG. Yeah, Corey. Um, yeah, he's the man. Yeah, we've he followed me back uh, when I was still in college. So he's he's oh, sort really? of like, mm -hmm. so we've known or I've known about him, I guess. And he's sort of like followed my work for a little bit, uh, which is cool. Like it's it's cool to like have people on the journey. Like Nick Majuli has been like a day one person. Uh, Michael Batnick, like like the, those guys have just been there um, when I was back at like nine hundred and eighty nine followers on Twitter, and now it's like. 56k yeah so it's cool yeah it's awesome. how fast did that blow up uh i was like, at less than yeah go ahead oh i, I mean, understand I mean, the question i didn't know <laughs> asking no i well i shouldn't have assumed i shouldn't have been like yes let me tell you <laughs> let me tell you what i think you, <laughs> you, you uh yeah i try to pause usually but this is like it's just like kind of fun for me to like like so i was less than a thousand like back in january and now it's like 56. wow yeah so uh it's just cool, you know. Yeah, that, that many people like vibe, um, that they like my stuff. Like, it's just so, it's so nice. Uh, and like the support underneath the videos is always really cool. Uh, and like, like, and like being able to connect with people like who I never thought I'd connect with, like Matt Levine um, and other people like that. It's just been like really nice. So yeah, and Twitter is really up. powerful for that. I, I will tell you, uh, to the extent that you want me to. Uh, because it came up, you said like, would would they be listening to me if I wasn't a woman? And I I think that the answer is unanswerable. Mm -hmm. I you know would not. I probably would be less inclined to have 
a random, you know, 23 year old guy uh, on the podcast, because frankly, I think guys have enough spotlight and finance as it is. Mm -hmm. But if I didn't think your content was dope, I wouldn't have you on the pod. Yeah. You know, like, I think you are really, really talented at what you do. Mm -hmm. And I think that you're at a really interesting point where you're talking to people that are learning about finance. And I respect a lot how you do what you do. And I hope that there are more people out there that are like you, because I think that uh, the younger generation is going to continue to turn to people like you and yourself, obviously. Um, and I, I think we need more people that view the world like you do, because I think it's going to be increasingly, uh, I'd say it twice, important over time. So yeah. that's why you're here. And I hope that's why people are enjoying the conversation. I don't think it's because you're just a woman or something yeah. like that. She's a girl. No, I, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> Let me listen to her. Well, <laughs> shit, I got to listen. She's a girl. <laughs> no, I, I, don't, I don't think so either. <clears throat> um, yeah. I, yeah. No. Um, and yeah, I mean, like for my audience, like a lot of them are like around my age, which is like, like being 23, 24, like 22. It's just like super weird because you're like, what's an adult? Am I that? And you're like trying to calibrate and like figure it all out. And so I, I've started posting like a little bit of adulting content on, on Twitter and just like get, <laughs> define or, adulting or, content. TikTok. Let me let me know what this is. Well, I just went through like the worst move ever. Like I moved from one side of L.A. to the other and everything that like could have gone wrong did go, did, did go wrong. Um uh. And I, yeah, so I, I just kind of like talked about, and like also for me, um, you know, leaving asset management, because I thought I was going to be in asset management forever. I thought I was going to be a cap group my entire life. And it's a great company. Uh, but for me, I, I was like, I can't do this. I, I can't be here forever. And so it was a huge like cognitive dissonance between like what I thought I wanted and what ended up happening. And so I made a TikTok about that, just being like, hey, it's okay if you're uncertain, because a lot of people are like, nobody really knows what they're doing. Um, and so I think like that kind of content helps the audience too, because like with the markets and with the economy and all that stuff, like it really when it, when it boils down to it, it is sort of like the capital I individual that you have to like at the end of the day sort of worry about, which is you, you're the capital I individual. Um, so yeah, you're a part of the economy. So it makes sense to make content about you, the, the individual. So that's how I think about it. Yeah. So what, uh, what happened at cap group that you sort of said, I want to go a different direction or, or, and I don't mean that it was something that would happen there. I mean, maybe it was just, you wanted to pursue this passion, but um, kind of what made you make the choice? Because it's pretty quick that you made the choice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, uh, so like the pandemic sort of was like an eye opener where you're like, ooh, like what? Am, what do I really care about? And for me, it's financial education. Like that's what I'm what I'm here to do for at least a little while is like educate people. And for for Cap Group, like I, it was great, like awesome job, like learned a lot. But that wasn't in the cards and in, in how things were looking to shape out. And for me, um, I'm I struggle with like rules a little bit. Like I like to do what I want to do when I want to do it. And when you're at a corporation, you're working for them. Like the, it, it, and you should be right. Like you're there for them. They're paying you. You should do what they say. Um, but for me, I'm like, no, I want to do this idea right now. I don't want to do my work. I want to. Yeah. I want to do this idea. Um, I want to build something. I want to try something else. I want to talk to different people, uh, and I want to share my ideas online. And you know, when you're when you're in an institution, you can't really do that because of compliance. And so I was like, okay, I'm just gonna you know take a leap, go into tech. I wanted to do tech. Um, makes sense to try tech. Why not? And so that's how, kind of yeah. how I thought about it. It wasn't anything that Cap Group did. It was just like me being a little bit too like all the time. So yeah. Well, I don't know that. I <laughs> I don't know that we need to frame it that way. I do yeah. think that it's true that once you get into a big organization, um, if you've got a little bit of more of an artistic bent or an entrepreneurial bent, yeah. it it's it tough. can be tough to. You're not really there to be that person, right? You're kind of there to be their person. Yeah. Uh, and you do strike me as your own person. Yeah. And uh, so I just didn't really, yeah, it just wasn't the best, like, creative environment for me. Um, great company, but, yeah, I just needed to strike it out and, and figure it out, and I, and I did. And my parents are, like, super supportive of that sort of stuff, too. Like, they're like, okay, you know, you'll figure it out, we think. Um, so, yeah, that, that, that helps a lot, yeah. How big's the town you're from? You don't need to name the town or anything like that, but I'm just curious. 
Um, I'm from outside of Louisville. So Louisville itself is around 600K, so okay, pretty yeah. big. Yeah, but where like the little, the town that I am from might be like 50 to 70K, yeah. Outside of it, yeah. So town. how many people that you grew up with are in big cities now? Um, five, maybe. Wow. Yeah, you don't. That's really, wild. Yeah. Do you mind telling people why uh, you sound like you're from Canada? <laughs> uh, yeah, it's actually kind of interesting. Um, I cover my accent. That's why. Yeah. Yeah. So, so uh, how how thick is your accent when you're at home? Uh, so I, I've been covering it for a long time. So I do. Well, so I do kind of speak like this all the time now. Uh, when I am just around my friends and I'm not like presenting per se. It, it, it can get pretty thick uh, and um, yeah, but this is sort of like an affectation that I've developed because I felt like the Kentucky accent was sounded silly, um, which is so unfair. And I really, if I could go back, I wouldn't have done that, but that was why. Yeah. So not super thick, but definitely drop the G's. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, I think in general, the Southern accent, uh, Look, if you're going to pitch financial content, I'm not sure that pitching it with a Southern accent is like the best idea in the world. Yeah, there's a lot of stereotypes, um, which really is yeah. unfortunate. Yeah. yeah, it is unfortunate. But that, you know, you are selling a package product and part of the package is how it sounds. Right. Yeah. So yeah. it makes some sense. But maybe over time, you'll uh, you'll let the draw back out. If you listen to my YouTube videos, especially the newer ones, it, it does drop quite a bit because yeah. I just started to get into the, like, it's just me ta talking to myself in an empty room. So um, you just sort of like let it loose a little bit, you, you get crazy. Um, and so that, that, that ends up happening. Yeah. Yeah. I, I got a kick out of the, uh, a couple of your YouTubes, but um, I like how, how excited you seem when the questions come in and then like, you do a really good job of editing. And then the one thing that you said is, uh, that like stuck with me is you were like, it seems kind of crazy, but it'll go on until it can't or whatever. And I was like, <laughs> yes, that's exactly what I think too. Like it'll go until yeah. it stops. I don't know what to yeah. tell you. In my, yeah, in one of, that's one cool. of, yeah. In one of my recent TikToks, I said, it doesn't matter about the thing. It matters how the thing is thinging. And that seemed to really stick with people too. <laughs> so if you just, yeah, because um, it makes sense, right? Like, oh, it's not about the thing. It's how the thing is thinging. Um, it's not like this will keep on going until it doesn't. Like, it, it, you know, it's, it's sort of the, the, that package advice. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, uh, I I don't know. I'm very interested in how the young young younger generation is getting, and I I'd like hate to be the guy talking about the youngins, but that's what I've become. Um, and I'm really interested to see how it all develops and whether or not uh, I I hope that over time um, the idea of getting rich fast subsides, and that like something that you had talked about. Uh, and I think it's that first episode of your pod where you were like the sort of that American dream of working and saving. And I, I almost think that you said that it was like sort of gone uh, for the younger generation or changed or something like that. I hope that um, I hope that one, I'm misquoting you. And I hope, too, if I'm not misquoting you, that change. Uh, I don't know. I hope I hope more faith gets instituted uh, in, in financial markets, because otherwise we could be in for a problem. Uh, you're not misquoting me. I said that. Yeah. Um, and I was more speaking to like the two, like the, um, like the white picket fence house retire at 65. Uh, I think a lot of us know that that's just not something that is accessible to us because of sort of the structure of the world that we live in. Um, yeah. So that's kind of what I was speaking to. And I think that the get rich. I'm going to stop you real quick, okay? Yeah. Because I do care about how people talk to themselves. When you say we know that it's not available to us, I hope that you're removing yourself from us. Because I guarantee you with your talent, <laughs> you're going to be able to get wherever you want to go. And I think that you need to know that. Uh, well, thank you. I, I appreciate that. Yeah, I mean, the reason I okay. say this, the reason I say us is because I, I consider myself a member of my audience. <laughs> um, so, I know. I yeah, know. I just yeah. want to make sure that 
no, I there's nothing my, in your brain you. that needs to hear that. No, no, that's the, I, it's always good to hear validation. <laughs> um, so, so I do appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I just think on aggregate, a lot of people my age, um, know that, or, or, or think maybe think they think they might not be, they know that this sort of like what our parents had and what our grandparents had, especially just isn't as, as attainable as it used to be. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'll tell you the thing that's going to be tough is like our, at least our parents, gener- well, my parents' generation. Um, Jesus, fuck, I'm getting old. Um, <laughs> the, the, you know, they had, they had a lot less competition. Yeah. You know, just generally. Uh, yeah. But the the quality of life does continue to get better and better and better over time. Yeah. So hopefully there's some answers here that can, uh, you know, maybe the cost of living comes down or... Mm-hmm. Like something that I that I has always blown my mind, and I think Airbnb and Uber really like kind of framed it well. But like, why do so many older people have a second home? Like, I can just rent a second home. Like, I don't need to own that shit. And worry about the roof leaking and all the crap mm-hmm. that comes along with ownership. Like, the rental economy, I think, could maybe um, increase people's quality of life without all the all the costs. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I think like the older generation probably thinks of real estate as like, as you know, like an asset and investment. Um, the more homes you have, the more you can sort of flex. Now everybody's going to be flexing in the metaverse. Uh, so it's a little bit different. That's right. But yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, no, it, it's odd. Um, for me, I'm like, I don't really want to own a home because I have no idea where I'll be living in honestly a year. So it doesn't make sense to even try and buy one because I'm just like, I'm on the go. I'm trying to figure stuff out. I don't need, like you said, I don't need to be worrying about how the roof is leaking. I just need a place yeah. to sleep. Yeah. Yeah. My two cents is uh, do your own thing and rent while you're doing your own thing. Because mm-hmm. paying a realtor sucks. Mm-hmm. It's mm-hmm. a very real cost. Mm-hmm. Uh, what are your thoughts on the metaverse? Where are we going? Everybody's talking about the metaverse these days. Mm-hmm. You're a big Roblox fan, correct? Mm-hmm. Uh, yes, I am. Yeah. Do you, yeah. are, are you engaged on Roblox? Do you create for Roblox in any way, shape or form? Play it or just like the idea? I love the idea, yeah. I'm, I'm um, not on the platform just because oh, I don't have time to like build stuff, unfortunately. Or I don't make the time, I should say. Um, but yeah, so I learn, um, I, I, I did like a deep dive on them. That was like my first piece when I, when I left Cap Group. I, I did a deep dive on Roblox and it was really in the context of like, how do we, you know, how do video games sort of become, because video games, I think, are always like a leading indicator of where the world is going. So video games have had like NFTs for a long time, like the digital in-game skins are basically NFTs. Um, And also like the metaverse, so sort of this VR, AR stuff, like right now exists in video games, so that's gonna apply to the broader world. So the metaverse is sort of this like, this virtual reality becoming, you know, quote unquote physical. So we're able to engage, like instead of us being on the Zoom call right now, like we'd be in the same like metaverse room and we'd be in person. <laughs> yeah. Like that's that sort of stuff. Digital coffee shop is how I like to describe it to people. So I'm, I mean, like Roblox is probably going to execute on that moving forward because they already have like developers. They already have the user base. They're aging up their user base very quickly. And then like games like uh, Fortnite are a really good example. So Epic is going, moving in that direction too. Um, yeah, so I'm I'm excited. I, for me, like I worry about the complications of the metaverse in terms of how we think about our actual physical reality, because I think there's still so much that we have to do in terms of like cleaning up planet Earth that we can't just like hop into the metaverse right away. Like we have to, and it's not saying that we'll forget about Earth, and I don't think we can, but yeah, there's just like other things that we have to worry about too. Yeah, well, uh, until we're all ready player one and on a treadmill and stuff like that, you still got to take care of your physical exactly. body too, yeah. right? Yeah, exactly. But um, it is interesting how much more, it, it, it does seem like an inevitable trend that more of our physical life moves online and more of online starts to permeate the physical life and the meld is, I think, what people are referring to as the metaverse. Yeah, yeah. Before we all go full-blown matrix. Yeah. I, yeah, I know. It, it's kind of, I don't know, like, I think about it a lot. And I think like one of the things that is hard is like, we've never sort of experienced this stuff 
Um, so it's hard to like actually envision how it works. Like, like um, I, Marsha McLuhan, who's one of my favorite philosophers, basically has this quote where it's like, a fish can't perceive that it's in water because it's always been in water. So I think that's kind of hard for us to think about like how we exist in a different quote unquote reality because we've always been in this quote unquote reality. So what does it actually look like to be in the metaverse? Like, I don't think anybody really knows what that'll be, but we can learn a lot from science fiction. Like to your point about Ready Player One, like they've already kind of thought about that a lot. Yeah. Yeah, I hope it's a little less dystopian than that, but whatever. Maybe. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea. Yeah, I mean, right now, um, I, I don't know. Yeah, that's like a whole commentary on the state of the world, which can be viewed positively or negatively, I think, depending on where you're standing. What's your view? I mean, Are you an optimistic person or a slightly pessimistic person by nature? I'm a cynic, yeah. So that, yeah. And, yeah, that can be, and that makes me like, I think a decent investor, but um, yeah, so I, I tend to operate very like, uh, like conscious up, I guess. Um, I, I would say I'm pretty optimistic on like the state of humanity. Like I really, technology I think is great. Like I think there's a lot of people building stuff that's going to help us, but I also like, <clears throat> and especially cause like moving to LA, like just become very aware that like there's people who are not nice out there and you just have to like operate with that in mind. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, I, I hope that the nice people find you yes. and um, I'm going to ask you if there's anything else you want to talk about, but uh, I'm down to stay as long as you want or I'm down to end it. Uh, either way, I want you to know that uh, to the extent that I or anyone in my network can help you, um, let me know because I, I do think you uh, you got a cool thing going on. Yeah, yeah no, thank you. I'm, um, I'm actually taking like um, uh, some time to like really think about media and content and education. So if anybody has any ideas and like wants to chat about how they think financial education should be shaped, like that's going to be at the forefront of my um, personal, how do you say, like personal, personal creed of conduct <laughs> moving forward. So uh, happy to happy to chat with anybody who also is thinking about it. Yeah, I'd love to actually. All right, yeah. cool. Well, that's the ask, folks. Reach mm. out to Kyla if you got a any ideas for her and um tune into her content it's great stuff yeah subscribe so to my thank you newsletter. very much for uh <laughs> the newsletter yeah dude, stan <laughs> what is it is it stan with kyla is the uh is where the, is that what i click on your twitter profile that oh. gets me to all of your stuff yeah the stan with me yeah the stan with me yeah so if you just yeah. go to i'm at kyla scan on twitter um so if you go to stan with sandwith.me slash kyla scan that's like all my stuff but i'm super active on twitter i check my dms um, I can't say I'll respond right away. I do have a little bit of a lag time, but I do see them. So I will respond eventually, sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> so. All right. Well, cool. thank you very much for your time. Of course.